now joined by Ari Temkin, Big 12 Radio Network on TuneIn Radio. Ari joins us. And effective next week, he'll be with us every Monday, barring some conflicts that come up because he's a busy man. Ari, I, I mean, teams that needed wins played against teams that needed wins, and you had what TCU did, you had what Kansas State did. You saw BYU flex their muscles. Arizona said, hey, don't forget about us. Isn't it lovely? To, and then, of course, Colorado at UCF, the loveliness of you never know in the Big 12 Conference. Yeah. I mean, as soon as you think you've got things figured out, that's as soon as you figure out you really don't know what you're talking about. Um, and take it from me, I had went 0 for 5 this week and pick the five games that I picked in the Big 12 against the spread, and <laughs> my record is – brutal this year uh, it's like six for 19 so yeah i i don't know what i'm talking about <laughs> when it comes to predicting these games and predicting who's gonna win um i mean i thought ucf would would cover uh, against colorado that they completely flipped the script in that game um you know arizona that had defensively struggled and had not been able to get other weapons involved beyond just t-mac suddenly did that and and their defense showed up so yeah it, it's Whatever you expect to happen is not going to happen at the exception of my Jayhawks, it appears. <laughs> uh, yeah, oh, the wheels have, have, are off uh, in Lawrence. I mean, it's Mario. not Florida State, Paul, but it's, no, you know, it's, it's not, bad. Hey, Man, what a, what, what a game yeah, that whoa, whoa. would be, huh? Hey, one and four is that one and four, That would be an ESPN brother. Plus game, too. One and four is one and four. <laughs> yeah. You know, you're, it's look, all bad. Yeah, look, we're both ugly chicks at the bar hoping to get whatever we can. Like, there's no there's no dressing it up. Like, yeah. you know, yeah. yours Lindenwood. might be... In slightly better shape than mine, but like it's not. Well, it's, it's, it's like a half win at that because they beat an <laughs> NAIA school. So yeah. I mean, <laughs> exactly. It's so um, we won't talk about Kansas much, uh, Ari, um, because I also have to go home today. Um, but uh, <laughs> when you when you look at when you look at the way this conference is now shaking out with BYU on top, Colorado looks like. They might be an actual complete team, you know, like in a in a sense that they can that they can win games a couple different ways. Uh, it's three weeks ago we we kind of all thought like, well, this Dion thing was was cool while it lasted, but it, it doesn't look like it's going to stick. And now the league is topsy turvy, and uh, nobody knows what's going on. Yeah, no, I mean. Colorado is the best example of it. I think maybe Arizona is, um, you know, it's like the transit of property thing, you know, that, that that's rare gets ugly head. I mean, it, you know, Colorado is really interesting because I think like, let's separate the, you know, the fact from fiction when it comes to them and really everybody. So like, what do we know after four or five games for these teams, Colorado can defend, you know, this is a dramatic improvement defensively from what we saw last year. And that, you know, I mean, it, it'll come and go from the standpoint of they may give up some yards or you're going to have some interceptions. They're going to lead to some points, but ultimately, I mean, what they've done under first year defensive coordinator, Robert Livingston is impressive. We actually uh, recorded an interview with him today and you know, he just, he came in with the right mentality. This is a guy that spent a decade with the Bengals organization, still very young, I, you know, not much of a connection to Dion. So he may have come highly recommended, uh, but you know, just kind of put, wanted to put together a defensive game plan week to week that would benefit his players. And I think it's doing that. Um, also shared a hilarious story about Travis Hunter that he was talking strategy with him on the sideline. And suddenly he, Travis is like, hold on, I'll be right back coach. And then uh, Livingston looks up and he's sees Travis Hunter streaking on the sideline for a 60 yard touchdown pass. <laughs> <laughs> so it's that's like, awesome. that's just, I mean, he, what he's doing, what Travis Hunter is doing is absurd. And I mean, I, from a guy that, coach at the NFL level. I mean, he, he's going to be a two way player at that level too, because try to figure out which way, which side of the ball he's better at, you know, you're, you're, you're taking away half the field on one side and you know, the ability is a explosive wide receiver. You, you're just not getting the full boat. If you take this guy to the top five pick, uh, but I digress, you know, the, the thing though with Colorado is it's like, they completely flipped the script on UCF where they stopped UCF's run. And again, the Colorado defense, is something we can look at and say, like, this is drastically improved. I'm buying that. It's the run game that, okay, let's see it now work for a few straight games. You know, I mean, let's let's see how explosive this offense can be um, in terms of running the football and then and then passing, because that's obviously going to limit the the amount of opportunities you can get hits on Shadur Sanders. Um, so, you know, that's kind of the thing that I'm looking for. What moving forward is, you know, the offensive line didn't look to be much improved, especially coming out of that Baylor game. Um, it certainly did in this game uh, on Saturday. And so, you know, again, they have a bye week now. So what do they look like coming out of the bye week? You know, Arizona, 
that's one of those things we talked about. One of the trends for them was that, you know, they couldn't defend very well and they weren't getting opportunities, you know, for guys other than T-Mac in terms of their, you know, their, their receivers and, and weapons. And, you know, Matt Adkins, who they've been their tight end coach took over during the bye week as the play caller. And we saw immediately, you know, what that looks like. They got their tight end way more involved. This is a guy that they were talking throughout the off season, like he was going to be a huge part of their offense. So I think the mistake that they made was handing the reins to Dino Babers and not just giving it to Adkins from the start. And, you know, what, what we saw was, you know, an impressive win. Now, you know, will we continue to see Isaac Wilson? Because I think they also showed a, a blueprint of, you know, really force and they had the 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 corners on the outside. A guy like Takario Davis just completely took away receivers for uh for Utah. And I think like so what they did is they basically said Dwayne Aquina, our old buddy from Texas, said, you know, we're we're gonna play straight up on the outside one on one and see if Isaac Wilson can consistently beat us. And we're gonna bail out to stop the run against a guy like Makai Bernard, who is really, really spectacular. So, you know, we don't know the future of Cam Rising. I think we all expect that he'll be back following the bye week, but we spent an entire season last year figuring that at some point Rising would be back, only to never see him come back. So I hope we do. Utah, and, and to me, guys, big picture, what I learned this week is U Utah could represent a second potential playoff bid for the Big 12 because we know the, the type of esteem that the country, the perception of Utah, what, what the perception is of them. And they have a legitimate excuse here with three weeks playing games without Cam Rising. They went two and one with Isaac Wilson. You know, if we're looking at teams that can potentially look at the committee and say, hey, this is a potential extra team that, you know, again, maybe Utah wins the Big 12 and it's moot. But if Utah does win the Big 12, I think they, and depending obviously how the rest of it shakes out, if Cam Rising does play and comes back healthy and plays to his potential, um, I think Utah has a, a built-in excuse here that could play well when it comes to the committee to get the Big 12 in a, a second bid. Ari, how all in are you on BYU? I mean, the big 21 nothing lead, 31-14 at halftime. They were dominating, and then Baylor came roaring back after the slow start. But they're 5-0, and man, and Jake Retzloff has been much better than I anticipated him being. The defense is obviously very strong. Uh, they've got a break now, and then they'll have Arizona at home, Oklahoma State at home. So they don't go on the road again until like a month to the end of this month, um, plus the bye. So what are your thoughts on where the, the things stand with the Cougars and Kalani Sataki? Yeah, certainly if there's a fan base that can, you know, uh, identify what I'm going through as a Kansas fan, it would be Baylor with these two backbreaking yeah. finishes in back-to-back -back weeks. Um, you know, the thing, so first off, Man, what if Sawyer Robertson hit Monterey Baldwin down the seam uh, late in this game? Yep, like the Colorado I, game when he had Ashton Hawkins and you didn't connect yep. on that one either, yep. Yep. So, I mean, Baylor basically had three possessions down the stretch of this game down six points, and BYU's defense turned them away all three times. And that, to me, like, that's... BYU has defensively been so good this year. They obviously weren't in this game in terms of points. You know, they had really been limiting teams to points, and so they gave up a ton of points by their standards in this game. But I, I I just thought, man, when they needed three stops, that's what they got. There was three possessions that Baylor had, I think with starting with about eight minutes to go in the game down six, and they turned them away on all three possessions. One of those included, um, you know, that that miss on Robertson to Baldwin. And then one of them was after um, the INT with, with Brett Slap through a, a pick with four minutes to go. And, you know, BYU's defense did it again. Um, so, I, like, that's – am I buying them? Yes, because their defense is legit. And I think, again, we saw that down the stretch of the Baylor game. When they needed it most, that's when they got the stops and their defense did a really good job, especially given some pretty, you know, significant circumstances, um, you know, and then how they mismanaged that last possession where they got the unsportsmanlike conduct penalty, which saved a, a timeout for Baylor. Even then, like they kind of shot themselves in the foot a few times down the stretch of that game and still got those stops. So, I, you know, I'm a, I'm, I'm, I'm a believer in them. Um, you know, Paul got to see a, a pretty good seed at, at SMU Florida State this weekend. Sorry, Paul, but yeah. I saw SMU BYU this year yeah. and I was not impressed with SMU leaving that game. So, I mean, you know, again, sh showing how good BYU's defense is now in hindsight, they held Jennings in check that game in a big way. Um, so, yeah, I mean, they're they're very impressive and their turnaround guys year over year on the defensive side of the football is remarkable. They didn't add a ton in terms of personnel. But it's Jay Hill, you know, a guy that we expected to be a really good defensive coordinator for them. You know, a, a longtime uh, Utah assistant, worked with Kalani Sataki, Utah, became a head coach at Weber State. And, and 
then rejoined his friend Kalani Sataki at BYU last year when he needed it. And their defense was really, really bad last year. And again, it's not as if their personnel is dramatically better. You know, they did add a guy like Jack Kelly, who I think is really good in the middle of their, their linebacking core, but Tyler Batty, they've just got a bunch of dudes and it's the right system and scheme. And I mean, they're again, playing exceedingly well. So I think that gives them an opportunity with Retzloff who's coming around. He had a huge first half, obviously in that game where there was what a four touchdown cushion at halftime. Um, and then, you know, again, their defense sort of probably rested a little bit and took, it took for granted what Baylor was going to be able to do. So Robertson hit them, looked impressive, but yeah, I'm, I'm buying BYU. Um, and again, the, the one thing, the reason I picked uh, Baylor to win and cover this week was one, the, all the public money was on uh, BYU. And so I faded them, but two, like they couldn't win games. The vampire BYU, the vampire Cougars was real. You know, their record in night games, so much better than the record in day games. So I think like getting over that part of it too is huge for them. Um, you know, winning on the road. This is obviously a team that wins a ton at home. They've got a huge home field advantage. They're legit. And again, it's not as if their personnel is that much different. It, it's just the the coaching and the scheme and the, and the confidence. The one thing I'm concerned about with them is their running game. You know, they're LJ Martin, they're down running backs here. And though they've gotten enough, you know, it's just a lot to put on a quarterback that in Retzloff that, you know, has thrown a propensity to throw some picks, doesn't complete balls at a high percentage, still has some flaws. But when it, when it comes down to having a good defense and getting stops at a man, BYU is really good at that. Well, uh, after they played SMU, SMU has scored over 100 points against TCU and Florida State. And they didn't score a touchdown in that game, in yeah, that, in that yeah, game against BYU. Yeah. No, yeah. And again, I went to that game thinking both these teams aren't very good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. yeah, BYU's definitely been one of the surprises, absolutely one of the surprises this year. Yeah, and, and the thing is, every person we talked to from BYU around the program all offseason was like, I, I don't know. Yeah, like, no. they just didn't know. And then it's, it's been – a ridiculous well, well, uh, Oklahoma State surprise. Uh, yeah. You know, look at Oklahoma State going into last year, and there was just nothing on paper that you saw that was like, oh, this team's going to be good. Of course, this year, Oklahoma State was the exact opposite, and now look at how good they look. Yeah. But, I mean, in many ways, BYU, from a personnel standpoint, you couldn't look at their roster and think this is going to be a dramatic turnaround. It's just the stuff that you couldn't see. And, again, we probably should have given a little bit more credit to Jay Hill, who in year two – you know, it's just a vastly improved defense. And I think, look, I think that's what TCU is going through right now, too. You just, it's hard to go from that. And BYU didn't do this exactly, but TCU is going from a three down front to more of a four, two, five, more of a, you know, an, an even front. And, and like that takes time. You've got to build up a personnel. You need wider personnel than you do in that three man front. So it, I, I think T, what TCU is going through that a little bit right now with Andy Avalos in year one. Ari Temkin, Big 12 Radio Network, with us on uh, TuneIn Radio. Uh, we'll start to, next week to be with us on Mondays uh, in, in the 3 o'clock, uh, late 3 o'clock hour at 3.40. Is BYU this year's West Virginia? I mean, they might be this year's Oklahoma State. At, at this point, yeah, Okay. You, you know, I mean, look, I, I think the biggest jump that's being made right now is the quarterback position. You know, if you watched BYU at the tail end of last year, there was really not much, save for the Oklahoma State game, that gave you confidence that he could be and should be the guy moving forward. I think, you know, so when you look at what they brought in from a competition standpoint, you wondered, okay, how good, you know, how limited will they be there because the quarterback's just not very good. And, I, you know, the clue perhaps was in that Oklahoma State game where Retzloff played a lot better. Remember, they should have beaten Oklahoma State the last game of the season, but they didn't because Oklahoma State was the beneficiary of some crazy turnovers and some crazy things that happened at the end of that game. Um, and then, you know, and, and then again, sometimes your personnel, you might look like one of the things in college that's so hard to do is, you know, look at returning production and then project out because sometimes like in the case of Oklahoma state, how good was that offensive line? It's great to have everybody back, but how good was it? And in the case of BYU, you looked at the defense and you thought, man, everybody's back. But what does that tell us? I mean, BYU had like, I think it was like 11 sacks the entire season last year and Tyler Batty had five and a half of them and they lose their best linebacker who missed a good portion of the year last year and Ben Bywater because you know he didn't return so you're like again from a personnel standpoint there was really nothing on paper that would lead you to believe that BYU would be as good as they are um it's the coaching you know we should have probably put a little bit more stock in Jay Hill in year two and then you know again sometimes Sometimes in college, you expect guys to make jumps year over year, and sometimes they don't. 
I mean, we see this all the time, like where you just expect the older guys get the better they are. And that's not necessarily a one-to-one. Sometimes guys regress. They don't put in the work in the off season. They don't do the things they need to do to get better. And sometimes the guys like a Jake Retzloff, they do, they do exceed their potential from what we saw previous year. So yeah, I mean, they're West Virginia is a good comp too, in terms of, you know, could they be a nine win team? Um, but again, I think if, if the first half of the season has told us anything, this is gut check time. Now the calendars turned to October, you know, this is where the football season truly starts. We have much better trends on these teams. We have much better sense of who they are, much better sample. Um, you know, so we'll see now that they, they go from BYU goes from being, you know, the hunter to the hunted in a sense, you know, so we'll see, we'll see how they come out the other side of it. And they've got a, a tough stretch here coming up. All right, Ari, thank you, buddy. Appreciate you. Uh, keep doing the, what you're doing with the uh, Big 12 radio show on TuneIn, and uh, we'll talk to you next Monday. See, appreciate your time. Appreciate you guys. Ari, Take care. Ari Take care. Temkin with us. Appreciate the, the, the summary of the Big 12.